Good afternoon, everyone. In 1960, Vikram Sarabhai, one of India's space pioneers, said that India did not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in the exploration of the moon or the planets or the manned space flight. Of course, India was a very different country in the 60s. But India in the 21st century is definitely pushing the frontiers of space. Today, when the world superpowers debate a regime to regulate outer space activities, India cannot be left out. High profile projects such as the Moon Mission and the highly coveted Mission to Mars have elevated Indian scientific community to a global scale. Today, we have amongst us one of those men who has been instrumental in turning the seemingly impossible task to reality. He was ranked among the top 10 person scientific personalities by the Nature Science Journal, and his eminent contributions in the field of science and engineering won him the Padma Bhushan Award. Besides being the first project director of the Indian National Tsunami Warning System, he has held several important positions of national and international scale. On a personal front, he is a trained Kathakali artist and a vocal music practitioner. On this auspicious third anniversary of the Mangalyaan mission, ladies and gentlemen, without much ado, let's embark on a mission to Mars and beyond. And join me in welcoming a technocrat par excellence, an inspirational engineer, impeccable manager, better known as ISRO's man of steel, Dr. Kopilil Radhakrishnan. Thank you, Soumya, for that nice introduction, and Surya for inviting me to this great institute. I was also happy to listen to a, an excellent talk. Friends, today is a very important day for India and the world. For the first time, a small space-faring nation got into the vicinity of Mars and reached there successfully for the first time. That is one part of it. It conveyed a meaning to all Indians and all around the world, especially the developing nations, that we can do it, not only going to Mars, but anything that we consider impossible can be made possible. And we have our own way of doing it. Just before coming here, I had a brief telephonic talk with Saumya, and he gave me a few questions. And I will focus on those areas. We talk about space, outer space, when we talk about Mars. Many of you will be wondering what space has got to do with you. In fact, space has got to do several things with every one of us in this planet Earth today. It is touching the life of every one of you, knowingly or unknowingly. And its absence will tell upon you that you are missing something. Today, it's an enterprise which is 339 billion US dollars. That is the space economy. This is a domain in which today, 1 million professionals are working in 60 countries, not only government, but those in the corporate, big ones, and startups who have come to take daring steps. And we talk physically about this space, it starts from 100 kilometers above Earth. And there is a universe which is expanding, and there are scientists who are trying to understand more and more about it. So there is science, there is excitement, there is also an enterprise, and once you are in this profession, you will feel there is something which you have done for this country. 
and probably you can leave a legacy when you leave this world. It's quite exciting and it is exciting because we talk about systems which are quite large, quite complex and that's why we talk about rocket science. Uncertainties, many things are unknown and such a system has to work in an environment in the solar system of which we do not have much of knowledge. And as you saw recently, we talked about a PSLE which was going like every man's rocket, 40 successes and finally a small event, a heat shield did not just open and we had a problem. So that's rocket science. And when you talk about a system, it takes a long time to realize. It is something like 15 years if you have to build a space system. It has to work for about another 10, 15 years. So you should be able to foresee what is going to be the technology 25 years from now. Forethought is required. Relevance of that period, it's again important. And finally, it is not something which is an embellishment for the country, but an essential element of your disaster management, of planning your agricultural products, or helping the fishermen, or helping the grassroots people who are trying to develop land and water to tell what best way they can do it. So there are several things of importance for the country. So there is a great group of stakeholders looking at the performance of these systems. Today, India has 40 satellites, or a constellation of 40 satellites, doing communication, navigation, remote sensing, meteorology, etc., etc. And if one satellite has a problem, then someone in the country here is going to feel its absence. So this is something which is very important about the space systems. Now the question is, where are we going? When we talk about tomorrow, which is your theme. Somewhere in the 50s, there were only two countries who were looking at space, that is USA and Soviets. And today there are 60. Not only governments, but the corporates, I said. So on one side, there is large amount of international cooperation. We talk about NASA and ISRO coming together, making a satellite. There is also competition because there are corporates who are selling launch services, who are providing satellite services. And there are also startups coming with bright new ideas, making paradigm shifts. So if you look at the entire activity, you see broadly the business mostly in the downstream services using space, in providing equipment required to do those services, in having satellites in the orbit and in the launch services. That 339 billion US dollars, what I told, if you just find out the profile of it, mostly it is in the downstream services. That is where you make impact of all these resources that we have today and there are great actors which you know like in US, the NASA, European Space Agency, China, Japan, India, Russia and today we have a prominent place in the world in this area. Now the question is if you look at ISRO as an organization, many people say in government, here there is an organization which is working, which is performing. It's not something that I say, but it is seen. It is recognized world over. When NASA spends about 19 billion US dollar for their space program, India spends about 1 billion US dollar. And we are in the same club in terms of the capabilities that we have established.
we are into Mars along with them. We are building a satellite together to be launched in 2020. And obviously, NASA will not come to India if they did not consider us compete enough to work with them. If you talk about space applications for which Dr. Sarabhai envisioned this organization, we are considered the role model for the whole world. Indian built satellites have been bought by European customers on commercial basis. Indian satellite data is acquired commercially by countries in Europe, by US and other parts of the world. And since 1995, Indian satellite is considered the best civilian remote sensing satellite of the world. And one of the best constellations that the world has. So this is what we have obtained. So obviously your friends ask me, how ISRO or India is able to do so much with such a small outlay? Question number one. We also talk about a culture in which we have been working. As students of management, you talk about organizational culture. And what is that culture? What are those traits which will define that culture? And what is the secret of developing a culture where one organization of a size is performing, another organization of a similar size is not performing? What makes the difference? When there is a success or a failure, there is a difference in the way they respond. When there is a challenge, there is a difference in the way they look at it, take advantage of the challenge. What makes the difference? If you look at India today, the latest one, you will see photographs and small write-ups about 60 persons who made a difference for this country. I will talk about two of them. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and Professor Sadish Dhawan. Why they are among those 60 is they made a difference for the space program that we are talking about. In 1961, when the country decided that we must get into space, Dr. Baba, who was chairing Atomic Energy Commission, was asked by the Prime Minister, let us start looking at space. He located Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who in his building, the physical research laboratory was doing some experiments and he started this program. Pristine minds from various parts of this country, graduates, postgraduates in engineering science, flocked around. And a couple of people who were in the late 20s, early 30s, who were in US, who had some understanding of the programs there, also joined. What they had in common was a dream. What they had was the grit and determination that we must make a difference for this country. And he said, we will be relevant, we will be different from US and Russia, but we will use this high technology medium to find solutions for the problems that we face every day. That is number one. 1971, that's the year in which I joined ISRO. He was the director of Space Science and Technology Center 2 in which I joined. And after his death, we had another great person who again finds place one among those 60, Professor Sadish Thawan. He imbibed that vision and he did not say what my predecessor did was all wrong. He said, it is Vikram's vision, I only executed it but he executed it right royally. He defined what are the things, what are the targets. He gave the focus, space application, satellites, rockets for launching it. He built up an organization, a system. And I believe these two persons coming in that sequence, a dreamer and a builder in that sequence, made the difference for the country as far as space program is concerned. And we'll talk about the culture later. There is a question 
what's the kind of governmental interfaces you have. And this is the only organization in this country where the driver has the accelerator, clutch and brake in his control. We have a space commission which is the policy making body. We have a department of space which ensures the governmental parliamentary accountability and we have ISRO as an executing organization. All three led by the same individual. But with due diligence and discretion in not misusing those three roles. Of course, you can't have accelerator, clutch and brake operated without discretion. So this is what the government has provided or these men designed for it. And the Prime Minister, of course, is in charge of it. The second part of it is, if we have to be a meaningful space agency looking at the application, we cannot be in the ivory tower. We cannot be in silos. We have to be working with those who are going to use this in government and that we ensured with certain interface mechanisms where we took them as stakeholders, as people who have a say in the formation of it, INSAT Coordination Committee, National Natural Resource Management System, where we ensured that all those chiefs in the government are part of the decision-making process, owners of the system, and they will feel, yes, it is. For us, we have built it jointly. And this is a place where the organizational ego is left behind and we work with synergy. Much of the problem with organizations, especially those who are pursuing science and technology or academics, is I, I should publish, I should have the first authorship. But here in ISRO, we do not have that I feeling. We take it as a team. And that is the culture built by these people. If you see the launch taking place from Shihri Kota, which you must be watching these days on the TV, there are 1,000 people from chairman to the cook who will be engaged in that activity. Some of them sitting at the consoles, some of them working behind. If everything is going fine, it is fine. But problems will come. At that time, the leaders emerge, the teams emerge, and they solve the problem. They are not looking at that point of time, and there is a problem that is solved. Who is going to get the credit for it? Or who is going to get the Patma Award for it? The I is given to ISRO, and they work as a team. That is, again, part of ISRO's way of looking at things. So the first and foremost, the vision that is set out in the 60s is carried through shared by all in the organization and we don't stay stale saying that Sarabhai said so, so we will continue to do that. No. Somewhere in 2000 we decided we are looking at moon. Somewhere in 2010 we said we are looking at Mars and possibly the next step may be human in space. So this progress takes place without leaving the application part of it. That means our relevance for the country. Those days we had a couple of government agencies. Today, all departments in the government of India are users of space systems. So this is one part of it. So what we have been doing is, instead of getting isolated and doing a scientific pursuit, we became somebody who is relevant for the country, who is looking for which way we as an organization can be relevant, significant to the country. And if we are significant and relevant to the country, certainly the country will support the government will support us. All governments, irrespective of their affiliation, they have supported the space program and the Prime Minister has been in charge of it. So this is the second aspect of it. Then I said we have long gestation periods and it is essential that we set our targets for next 10, 20 years well in advance and we communicate this throughout and Develop that through a iterative process in the organization. When we decided that we are going to take up Mars Orbiter mission, 
what we did first was to communicate to all the members of the organization at various levels. It became their mission. To make it in 40 years, 40 months, an impossible task that was considered was made possible because everyone felt that it was essential for them to do it. And I tell you, they all would have got their salary and promotions even if they did not work on Mangalayan. No additional manpower in ISRO for executing Mangalayan. Still, that was done, what was considered as impossible. And for benchmarking, we had a mission. U.S. had a mission, and that was their 22nd mission to Mars, Maven. They took 11 years from concept to fruition. Of course, it carried larger number of scientific instruments. They came very close to Mars. This was our first attempt, and we did it in nearly 40 months. If you look at the cost of doing it, we were one-tenth of it. And if you look at the launch vehicle that we used or that we had is our PSLV. And they had a launch vehicle which had 10 times more capacity compared to this. They could reach a point of exit from Earth directly, but we had to go there in steps, but that we did with certain novelty and reached there. We, of course, had an orbit which was slightly farther away from what Maven had. We had very few scientific instruments, but our first mission had an objective, we should be able to reach there. And when we say we are reaching there, what is that technological capability that we have demonstrated? And what were the challenges that we went through to do that? How we took this country with us, in spite of all that criticism that people had at that time? And how we motivated our own team to do that in such a short period? So this is the message coming out of Mangalya or Mars. Our satellites normally, for remote sensing, they go in an orbit close to 1,000 kilometers above the Earth. If it's a communication satellite, that is at 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, precisely to be kept. When we did mission to Moon, Chandrayaan-1, that was 4 lakh kilometers, 400,000 kilometers. But when you talk about Mars, we talk about a distance of something like 50 million kilometers when Earth and Mars are close to each other, or 400 million kilometers when they are farthest. They go at different speeds. You have to capture an object in its future position. Without getting into the detail, you can do this only once in 26 months. You can require a geometry between Sun, Earth, and Mars. You have to travel in an orbit around Sun, 660 million kilometers. And when you start that journey from Earth, you should put it in a direction so that after these 300 days of travel, going through the forces of all the celestial bodies around, we will be at the target at 500 kilometers from Mars take or leave 50 kilometer. And if you have to estimate all these influences well in advance to start your journey, you should have that knowledge. And if you do not direct properly, you will miss the targets. So on December 1st, 2013, when we did that, the world looked at us saying that India is now in the business of doing it. The rest of it is a journey. When we have this kind of a distance, communication engineers will tell you that the signal will take time to reach the spacecraft. If the spacecraft has developed a problem around Mars, 
it will take about 20 minutes for us to understand what is happening there. And a corrective signal will take another 20 minutes. So what we required at that time is to empower the satellite to take its own decisions. You all deal with AI and it, how it impacts the human employment today. What we did was, what the mission controllers at Hassan or Bangalore normally do with every one of the spacecraft, looking at it on 24 by 7 basis, we transformed into algorithms and put it into the satellite itself. The satellite is able to know its help and also do what it is required. One is to look at this gap of 40 minutes for the signal to come and command to go. Second one, about two to three weeks in every year, the sun will come in between Mars and Earth. So no command can go from either side. Now it has managed. That's the proof that we are in the completion of three years now. It was done by our own scientists, engineers. Doing it is fine. But when you translate these ground rules as algorithms on the satellite, and if you are not looked at all modes of failure, you can get into serious problem. So it required also a very detailed kind of simulation on the ground. Obviously, when you have such large distance, your communication systems have to be more powerful. You should be able to find out the position accurately. These are all part of that game. One is to impart that velocity to reach there. We call it in scientific terms, the excess over escape velocity. All of you in your school days have studied 11.2 kilometer per second, why it is escape velocity from Earth. But if it has to go to another planet, it has to have a given excess. So US had a heavy, sat heavy launch vehicle, we had a small one, but we gave it in steps. And it is moving towards Mars, it has reached Mars. Now, if it has to take an orbit, we have to retard. And how do you put that brake? It is not through the atmosphere. It is through another rocket, which has to fire after 300 days of sleep. We had that also. So all this had to be realized. And for such a space environment, we had to make a satellite in 18 months after all this period of our time, launch, etc. If I take. How we did that? I learned about a term called critical chain management by an Israeli author, actually. Here, that was the main thing that we did. We have eight hours or 18 hours or whatever time to work, but the satellite has 24 hours to be worked upon. So we had teams to do that. And every one of us felt we are doing this for the national pride. And a small mistake, a silly mistake from anyone could convert that into a national shame. Everyone will say, you attempted, you wasted government money. So this was imbibed by everyone of all generations, starting from a professor you are who was in the 80s to the youngest generation in the 20s, they were part and parcel of this project. It was a one-time opportunity for many of them to contribute in such a mission. So that was the great source of inspiration for them. Unlike many other places where it is an employment for them that I work for eight hours, 36 hours in a week for you and you pay me this, here it was a national dream which has to come true and that's how they worked. And let us come to the brass tacks. When you say that we have done at lower cost, PSLV, GSLV or GSLV, Mar 3, if you look at the structure of it closely, you will find some, several similarities in the rocket stages that we have got. You will see the engines used in all of them have commonalities. That means we don't spend time reinventing the wheel. We have a principle of modularity. So as we use the same because engine of PSLV, in the GSLV stages, there are five stages where we use it, or use two engines in GSLV Mark III, we build on the heritage and we don't spend time. Much of the time in rocketry development is spent on ground testing. So if we can optimize 
and get the best out of it, then you save time, you save cost. It's a question of national philosophy. If you look at Russia, they will say, I will have 100 tests, I will do it on 20 articles. Here, we do on two articles, 10 tests, but design those tests in an intelligent way. We also these days have simulations possible without even getting into the hardware. We do all that thing. If you look at the avionics of all our launch vehicles, it's same. But only those modules are put it in different fashion, engineered with the level of redundancy that is required for bigger rockets. So these are all the ways in which we optimize. It is not just that the manpower cost is less here compared to many other countries. Our space systems are cost effective and external agencies have done this study and found this is one of the basic reasons for that. And the next part of it is the accountability that we have. There are also questions, you know, when you have failure and failure are bound to occur if you are getting into a field like space, which has intrinsically complex large systems which have to work in unknown, uncharted environments. What we do is preparedness. Prepare for all eventualities in the design, in the testing, in the reviews, and before we decide to launch a rocket or a satellite, we apply all of our minds together irrespective of the levels, look at all issues, and we say, yes, it is ready. We also get ready for all contingencies that a satellite or rocket can develop and prepare for that agency. Preparedness is important. When a failure occurs, or when there is a success too, we look at it and we learn what could have performed better. As students, you will know, if you get A, B grade, it's okay. If you get a few B grades, that is going to be a problem. Even if the rocket is successful and it has put a satellite, immediately our engineers will look at all the systems and how they performed. And there will be a few who could have given us trouble. We locate it and we improve it next time. So we learn from successes. When there is a failure, there is a normal tendency of fixing the responsibility. Who did that mistake? We never do that. We look at what could have gone wrong. How do we fix it? But as an organization, we have to take the responsibility for a failure, and that is to the boss of the organization. The boss takes the organization's responsibility for the failure. Face, that's important. And also, hold the hand of everyone. And if you start fixing the responsibility, people will not come up with issues. If something has gone wrong, they will keep quiet and you will find it in the rocket's blast. So there are several lessons that will come out of this organization and that could be applicable in your normal way of running any enterprise. There is a question, how an MBA like me decided to be with the space system. And what is involved in this leadership of a scientific organization is slightly different from what we see in other places. I went to IAM Bangalore from ISRO, and there was a question at that time whether I should go back to ISRO or get into lucrative assignments like what you will be looking for. For me at that time, it was a value-based decision rather than looking for my value at that point of time. Because a couple of elders at Tumba felt at the time of giving me the sponsorship that I will go back and I will contribute to that organization. So if I had paid that 10,000 rupees at that point of time and then got off, it's a travesty of trust. That is what I felt at that time. So many of my friends at IAM laughed at me. 
saying that why are you going back to R&D? Similarly, when I went back to my organization, where I was previously dealing with a high technology product, they also told you have forgotten engineering, now you are only a manager. But that is one way of looking at it. But later, they realized that the mix of technology and management helps one to look at things in a holistic perspective. You look at things as a total system. You improve your learn learnability, the perception of the issues. In the right in the introduction, he said, tsunami warning system, which is at six kilometer in the deep sea, and we talk about Mangalyan, there is something common between managing a tsunami warning system development and a Mars orbiter mission. And that is management. The way you look at things, the way you gear up the teams, the way you convince the powers that be for decision making, these are all part of it. And the other part of it is do something that's of relevance for the country. At that time, tsunami warning system was important for the country. In 2004, when that event occurred, the whole world was shocked. Several countries were coming forward to India and the neighboring countries saying that we will give you all the facilities. That was to get the patronage. We would not have got the best out of it. But here was a group which said, yes, collectively, from this country, we will do it. We convinced the people of the Indian Ocean region. And currently, that is a system which is serving from Kukatpalli, your neighborhood. It is serving the entire Indian Ocean region today. And the best systems that came. So, you can manage tsunami warning system. You can manage Mangalyan, provided you have a way of looking at issues. The question is, how do you develop leadership? There are several leaders who are born, but many leaders are evolved over a period of time. In my case, in my initial days, I observed, and after an MBA, I had an occasion to watch senior people very closely. And when I say senior people of those days, Dr. Kalam included. What I did was observe. Adopt, adapt, and also discard. If you look at n number of such people, you will see certain things which are attractive, which you should imbibe. And certain things you just discard. But when I had to perform the role of a leader, maybe at the in the late 30s and plus. I decided to study this subject as a serious student. And I have a good library of leadership material. Not only I studied, I started talking about it to my own younger generation leaders. Two of them are sitting here, Dr. Krishnamurti and Rekhu Venkatraman. So when you do that discussion, not only that you reiterate, you strengthen your own beliefs, you also help others to develop and come up as leaders. You also talk about several types of leadership pattern the previous lecture was talking about. Things which are not defined, that was the past. Now, how do you generate that ability in you to develop for the future? So this is Another thing you should get into, that itself is a subject, but I can tell you from 1998 till date, I have been student of leadership. And when you talk about leadership, what is involved is human being. Human being at all levels. And one has to develop that taste to connect with people in the organization. Everyone, young, or old, experienced, junior to you or senior to you, should feel a kind of connect. And how you establish that connect? It is through trust, it is through respect, 
and respect is given and taken. Every individual has a strength, a capability, recognize that. And they should be with you. And there has to be no gap between what you speak and what you think. Trust comes out of that consistency of behavior and consistency of talk. And our ability to be questioned. When I had two failures in my first year as chairman, GSLV failed. I faced not only the media, but I faced my own people in what you call the town hall mode. Town hall mode. I went to the centers, talked to them, and I took the questions. Organization went through difficult periods, which you would have read in newspaper and the media. We talked to them. And this communication between the leader and the people are extremely important. That is another part of it. So this is the time for question and answers. So I will stop at this point of time. How much time we have? Two minutes. OK, fine. Two questions. Sir, I have a question. Uh, you talked about space industry as a whole. It's a $339 billion industry. Uh, if we look up at India, uh, India is actually having a very less amount of uh, this pie as a whole. It's even less than 1%. So my first question is, what is your take on uh, uh, how space as a sector, India should grow? Uh, what is the future of space as a, from business perspective? See, 3, 339 includes the government contribution. If I take the space industry per se, commercial, it's about 260 only. Now, if you look at India, we are at 0 0.123. So my take is, by 2030, if we can have 1% of the global space industry, that's a big jump. And for that, we require two things. One is the capability of ISRO to produce launch vehicles, satellites, etc. And a vibrant Indian space industry. Today, they are all jobbing partners. They have to come together with the capability to build satellites, to build the launch vehicles in numbers. And that is what is essential. And there is a lot of enthusiasm today from the younger generation, the startups. They also have a role to play in defining this industry. Sir, and uh, second sec question may not be allowed as per the. <laughs> <laughs> One more question from another. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So, my question to you is you talked about the spirit of organizational citizenship and culture which is most prevalent in ISRO, how can the present-day corporate world replicate the same in their oh, organization? Oh. How can the present-day corporate world replicate this spirit of uh, citizenship in their employees uh, deriving from ISRO? See, replication is not the right thing, but to learn from that. And if you have to learn, you have to learn some of the traits. So you take depending upon what business you are in. And it is a continuing process. What was good for ISRO yesterday may not be the one required for tomorrow. So we have to be open to learn. There was a slide on authoritarian leadership and next two levels also, if you had seen. So the last one is what we are coming to. Provide the platform for the people to perform and know that the younger generation have the knowledge better than us. And what we have is the wisdom. That's all. Thank you. Thank you.